Hey, hello, and welcome to the sixth and final webinar in our 2015 High Tunnel webinar series. I'm Miranda Combs, and I'm an Extension Associate with the Center for Crop Diversification at the University of Kentucky. To conclude the 2015 High Tunnel webinar series, four High Tunnel producers will be sharing their successes and challenges of High Tunnel production. Paul and Allison Wiedeger of All Natural Farm will be talking about their more than 20 years of organic high tunnel production experience in Smiths Grove, Kentucky. Then, Mark and Velvet Henkel of Henkel's Herbs and Heirlooms will share their story as beginning farmers from the past eight years of production in Nicholasville, Kentucky. We will also provide some final resources and wish you good luck. I'd like to let everyone know that a copy of tonight's presentation is available for download in the Files to Download pod in the left corner of your screen. I also want to remind everyone that the recordings of our past five webinars are available on the Center for Crop Diversification website, along with the documents referenced during each webinar. Please visit our website and navigate to our new webinars page. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. To ask questions, simply type your questions into the chat box in the lower right corner of your screen. Christy Cassidy from the Center for Crop Diversification will be helping us answer questions throughout the presentation. Also, this webinar is being recorded and will be available in a few days on the Center for Crop Diversification's webinars page. Finally, at the end of the webinar, we'll have a survey link available for you to provide some feedback for us. We really appreciate and listen to the feedback you provide. We hope you enjoy the presentation and take away some great information. Without any further ado, I will hand the presentation over to the Wiedigers. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Good evening. What we're going to try to do tonight in a relatively short period of time is take 20 years of high tunnel growing experience and compress it into a, like a 30 minute presentation. So what we're going to try to do here is give you our words of wisdom from growing in a high tunnel. The very first thing I want to say is high tunnel growing is joyful. Uh, the sheer quality and quantity of product that you can take out of your high tunnel especially during the, the winter months. It just, just is absolutely fabulous. The smell of, of living soil, you know, the last few weeks when it's been uh, dreary and the ground's been covered in snow, is, is just something you almost have to experience to understand it. The other thing I like to tell you is that, in my opinion, many of us are pretty good growers, okay? Uh, it's not to say that there aren't challenges to growing, there obviously are, but I think too many of us find that marketing is really the hard part. Um, again, my philosophy is don't plant a seed until you have a market. And, and spend a little bit more time figuring out your marketing plan and use your marketing plan to build your production plan. For instance, let's talk here high tunnel tomatoes, okay? Um, our marketing strategy can really determine a lot of things for us. Years ago, when we first started doing high tunnel uh, tomatoes. Our goal was to be the very first farm at the market with tomatoes. So early farmers market was what we were looking for. But we also knew that our market wanted what we would call a slicer. Uh, I could come to market even, let's say with a slicer by the end of May, but I could come even maybe 10 days earlier with a salad tomato. The problem is our market didn't want a salad tomato and I would carry them right back home again. So Knowing what I'm doing here helps to determine my variety selections. Uh, again, for our early farmer's market, we're looking not only at days to maturity, but especially size and flavor. Um, knowing that now helps drive a, a, a market production. If we're trying to come to market early, this helps us figure out uh, how soon do we want it to go in the ground. If I'm looking to plant four to five weeks before frost-free dates, and I need to seed 10 weeks before that, that all helps determine my production schedule. Or perhaps I want to have tomatoes for a late fall market. These are all things to take into consideration and you're using your market strategy to drive your production plan. And no, that's really not my office because I've cleaned it since this picture was taken. But keeping good records, they're really key for this type of production. If you're going to maximize profitability. Records are what's going to make a difference. Again, they, they help you duplicate your successes and avoid your mistakes. The, the one thing you don't want to do is have a banner year and, and next year when you're putting together your crop records to look at each other and say, boy, when did we plant this in the high tunnel? 
I think also um, I would really say you want to educate yourself. Uh, today, you know, you go on online, just bring up Google and type in something like high tunnels, and it's amazing the amount of information available to you out there. Here, for instance, is a fabulous publication. I think this is out of Extension in Missouri, talking about proper irrigation and fertilization for tomato production. Here we have a, a, a chart that comes out of publication talking about watering your tomatoes. And what I find really interesting is, is basically that basically at about seven and eight weeks, uh, you're going to be using five to six times more water than what you do when you're first planting a crop. The other thing I think is, is really important on high tunnel production is drainage. This is something that many of us uh, aren't really familiar with. Uh, but basically, if you have a 30 by 96 high tunnel, an inch of rain, that high tunnel is going to shed over 1,700 gallons of water on every inch of rain. So at, at our farm, we actually have four high tunnels. They all sit up kind of in a cluster, one right after the other. The other day, in a 48-hour period, we had a three-inch rainfall. So basically, every high tunnel was shedding almost 5,000 gallons of water, and you took four of them together, and now we're talking 20,000 gallons of water. You either need to find a way to move that away from your high tunnel. You know, this uh, diagram here, you're seeing the use of perforated corrugated pipe. Um, one thing I was going to say, if you do this, you really want to wrap that pipe with something like a, a landscape fabric, because we find that the pipes really silt up quickly uh, from the soil getting to them. Uh, another step I think that other people may want to look at is perhaps uh, doing some type of water catchment, uh, especially like gutters uh, off your sidewalls. Um, I think that's maybe the next step to closing the, the, the circle of production here. But again, drainage is a key uh, element that you need to pay attention to. And I think we have to say that we know that because we did not. And because we did not put in drainage, because we didn't know 20 years ago to do it, we have high tunnels that, have, that are puddled, especially with the, the rain and the snow that we've had, and, and aren't drying out very quickly. So it's important. And I know they recently did uh, one of the webinars, I believe, was on drip irrigation. But something I like to talk about here is a, a couple of components to drip irrigation that sometimes we don't uh, pay attention to them. The first thing is a timer. Um, uh, this is a, a battery-operated timer. I'm going to say the price is right around $50. And I find this uh, so important to have. Uh, this allows me, what I like about it, it has a manual override. I can actually set up my irrigation system to run for exactly the amount of time I want it to. But uh, where I really find this is important is, uh, you know, so often we get into a drought situation during the summer. And on our farms, we're running irrigation 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This, this allows me to help zone my irrigation. I mean, one thing you don't want to do is say, okay, I'm going to water my high tunnel for three and a half hours, and I'm going to turn it on at 6.30 at night and come back at 10 o'clock and switch to another zone. And somewhere between 6.30 and, and 10 o'clock, you fall asleep on the couch. You wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning, and what you've done is flooded your high tunnel. Um, th this timer can prevent something like this. Uh, we also use a lot of the uh, uh, valved header to T-tape connectors because that does allow us to turn individual lines on and off in a, in a high tunnel. We find those really, really valuable and relatively inexpensive over a long run of time. Uh, UV does break them down a bit, or if you're careless, you can break the valve, but often even using a pair of pliers, you can still make it work for you. Nothing like to say is, is learn to cultivate weeds. Um, at this stage, they're easy to handle. I'll never forget the, when they look like this, you've got a real problem. That's chickweed. I think you can see some spinach in that bed. It's a little hard to see it there. Uh, what I find interesting about that is I remember when we first started growing in high tunnels many, many years ago, and many people would say, well, you know, chickweed is just a, an annual spring weed. It's just not an issue. But what you have to remember is if, if you're doing winter growing in a high tunnel, 
you basically have just created like a the, perpetual uh, spring. Yeah, exactly, right? You've given it the prime growing conditions it wants. You've got fertile fields, you've got the cool growing conditions, somewhat moist, and it's going to thrive. Uh, but again, uh, learning to take care of it at a young stage really makes a difference. Again, and never, never let anything go to, to uh, seed in your high tunnels. Here's a few things that we've learned. Again, never let any weeds mature and set seed. Um, I think what's also really important is, you know, try not to let that happen outside of your high tunnel. Um, there's like, you know, you've heard of like the, the PETA principle and things like that. But there's a principle about high tunnels that any weed that goes to seed in a half a mile radius of your high tunnel gets sucked into the high tunnel. It's like a vacuum pulling it in. It's, it's, it's amazing how that happens. It's either that or the manufacturers uh, paint the bows with different weed seeds. I'm not sure which, which, which occurs. Um, use weed barriers uh, like mulches when practical. I think to uh, utilize strategies uh, that eliminate or reduce the amount of cultivation needed. They are basically talking about solarization, and we'll hit on that in, in a few more minutes. But you know, there are things you can do that will totally reduce and eliminate uh, weed seeds. And again, before uh, weeds become a problem, make the time to cultivate. Uh, it's very, a lot easier to do. The next thing I want to say is that having a high tunnel may as well realize that at some point you are going to have an insect issue. It, it, <clears throat> it's just going to happen. May as well realize that Look at what possible problems you're going to run into and know how you're going to deal with them before they become a problem. The way to do this, uh, first of all, this should be early detection through scouting. Uh, we have an actual routine that we walk through our high tunnels every morning looking at certain plants, observing yellow sticky traps uh, to see what are we seeing here. Uh, I found over the years to utilize my uh, cell phone to take pictures especially like of the yellow sticky traps. Uh, that way, you know, it, it tells me, okay, on this date, this is what that yellow sticky trap looked like. And a week later, okay, so what am I observing here? You know, are there more insects or are there less? Uh, so that's part of recording it. And the last step, I think, is, is proper identification. You really need to spend some time so you know what you're looking at. Nothing we talk about is disease. Um, I don't want to say that sooner or later it's going to show up, but from talking to many high tunnel growers throughout the southeastern United States, this is something that, that does happen. For us, it was many, many years. Uh, I'm always shocked to hear from other growers who, within six months of the very first high tunnel, you know, they'd never seen some of these diseases out in the field, but here they are cropping up in their high tunnel. And again, I think a lot of this is because of the climate we're creating in the high tunnels that they become a uh, prime prime of uh, germination for many disease organisms. This crop here you're looking at, this is a mescaline crop. You can see the mescaline going down. Uh, this is a disease uh, was identified by the man in the upper right hand corner. That's Dr. Paul Vincelli, University of Kentucky. He and uh, Dr. Uh, Mike Bomford from KSU came out to our farm years ago uh, to help us uh, find out what this disease was and come up with a plan to control it. Um, we did a lot of experimentation on the farm. And these are things that we found out that, that number one, fungal diseases seem to be the most prevalent. So what we learned is that we really need to vent our high tunnel. We need to vent it early in the day because what we're trying to do is remove the moist air. Uh, moist air on plants is, is the number one killer. Um, so you really want to get out early um, or, you know, if you find you've got a lot of moisture, what you may want to do is vent, close, let the sun warm up the high tunnel, then open it up and revent it. That seems to really help move a lot of the moist air out. Um, my opinion is vent even when it's cold. We grow in our high tunnels 52 weeks a year. And, and what I've come to see is that plants will tolerate and become accustomed to cold air and will handle that better than they will damp air held in days at a time. Use tall roll up sides to, to move that air over tall plants. Think about, you know, especially if you're a high tunnel grower, if you've done tomatoes, you know, our 
determinate tomatoes in the high tunnel are easily five, six foot tall. You really need those tall roll up sides to try to move air over the plants. Have adequate spacing between the plants. So uh, that's uh, for our, us, that's a hard one to do. I really jam the plants in there. So that can become an, an issue. Uh, scout for disease and, and rogue out sickly plants. But be careful when you're doing that because it's easy to transmit disease between plants. We actually have buckets that are marked just for this purpose. And what for us, it's the last thing we do when we're done working in the high tunnels. So we're removing those sickly plants and they instantly or immediately come out of our high tunnels. Um, and then we either uh, burn them or, or actually just bag them up and put them out, uh, go to the trash dump with them. And lastly, uh, keep your soil biologically alive. Uh, that is so critical. Uh, that will help uh, prevent lots of issues and minimize uh, diseases if you do incur them. The thing we found that works the best uh, for disease is what we call solarization. And this is actually a heat, moisture, and time. So basically, we're using a uh, uh, either a construction grade poly or one year greenhouse cover. Uh, we solarize basically the months of July and August. We want the, the hottest months of the year. We have found that four weeks will kill most disease organisms for about a depth of six inches. But uh, we've also seen that if we can run that out to six to eight weeks, we really get excellent uh, control. This uh, works down to about six inches deep in the soil. You want to uh, till up your soil, then um, irrigate it, leave your irrigation in place, and cover it with a clear poly. Again, the clear poly is what you're looking for. We actually trench around the uh, perimeter, the inside perimeter of our high tunnel, lay the poly in the trench, and then cover it over with soil. So we're sealing it as tight as possible. Um, occasionally, we turn the drip on to keep the soil moist because that moisture is drawing the heat into the soil. And we're looking at temperatures 100 to 125 degrees. And not only does it kill disease organisms, but what we have found is that it will kill most annual seeds in the soil. So when you come back behind it and let's say plant something like a mescaline or spinach crop, you have no weeding to do whatsoever. But the only things we've seen survive it are uh, Nut sedge. Yellow nut sedge, Johnson grass, and, and morning glory. But other than that, but really, if you can reduce it to just a few items like that, it really reduces the amount of time you have to take to weed. One more important thing is to not till too deeply, because if you till below that area where you solarize to, you can bring those weed and fungal organisms right back up again. So we try to be just very shallow tilling. This is, you can see here in our high tummy, you can see that stuff, piece of poly we're laying over. If you look on the left-hand side, you can actually see the trench we put in there so we can lay it in there. Oh, there it is. And uh, so we can put it in and then pull soil back over it um, to actually seal it in place. That's just kind of what it looks like. The temperatures get really, really warm in there. Um, this actually, um, this was a year we were expanding that high tunnel. It was a 60 foot long high tunnel. You can kind of see the front of it with no end to it. And we were expanding it out to be a 96 foot long high tunnel. So yes, this can even work out in the field for you. Next thing I like to say is, in order to be the most profitable, I think you really want to take steps to maximize your production year round. Um, I think having a some type of production plan really helps you uh, realize maximum production. So here we've got a, a, you know, just a layout of our high tunnel. Our goal here is what we can have available for market opening day in the uh, beginning of April. So we start out and we're planting a certain number of row feet of beets. Now for us, on that sidewall, we have three rows of drip tape. We've got a row of beets on either side of it. So that's actually six times the 24 row feet. Our next planting happens uh, about 10 days later or so, uh, 12, 14 days later. We're putting in uh, some salad turnips. In comes March 9th, and we're really loading it up with tomatoes. These are going to give us our early tomatoes. We've done a, a very, very early variety, one that's going to start producing about the end of May. 
and produce for about three weeks. The other one is going to come on about 10 days later. We've also put in some specialty tomatoes and some cherry tomatoes. We've also put in a double row of bell peppers. We put in a double row of eggplant. We put in multiple plantings here. We've got a, a Russian kale. We've got winter boar, which is a curly kale. And we also have some Swiss chard. We've seeded them uh, four weeks earlier. Uh, we have uh, drip tape in there is on eight inch uh, emitters. So on every eight inches, we have a plant. So we have a heavy, heavy production. We've also on that same day put in our first planting of lettuce. We're using the outside rows. In that bed, we've got four rows of drip tape. So the tomatoes are going down between number two and three row of drip tape. And we're planting a, a head of lettuce at every emitter on the outside. Of, um, nine days later, we're putting in our first planting of radishes. We're putting in two different varieties. One that's going to give us a harvest in 21 days. The other variety we can harvest in 28 days. Now we're also doing a second put, uh, planting of lettuce. We're doing another planting of radishes. Another planting of lettuce. Another planting of radishes. So we have a really nice full high tunnel. At this point, Allison walks in and says, what are you thinking growing all that eggplant? You never know you never have sales on it. And being a nice guy, I am, I instantly take it out and think, well, okay, what else can I put in here? So I start putting in a planting of carrots. So I really like sugar snacks, very, very sweet, uh, grows really, really well. I've stuck in a, a planting of spinach, so I know that's going to come on and be about perfect. And do another planting of carrots. So basically that can give me a, about six weeks of carrot harvest, and I'll be able to uh, bring spinach to the market from basically baby spinach on opening day and carry it all the way to the end of May, beginning of June. So I think, too, the next step is learning how to become efficient at what you do and tracking your production and sales so you can be profitable. Remember, if it's not profitable, it's not sustainable. This is a book that we found to be very, very useful. It's called The Organic Farmer's Business Handbook. And I think it really teaches you how to analyze your operation for profitability. So what we do then is for all the different crops we have in our high tunnel, we actually break them down and we now look at, okay, this is the first one we put in. We put in beets. We know we've got 24 row feet, but that's with three rows of drip tape. So we actually have six rows. So we know we've got 144 feet of beets. We know we set them out on one and a half inch centers. So we know how many beets that's going to produce. We're going to assume we're going to be able to harvest and market 80% of them. We're putting six beets in a bunch. That tells us how many bunches of beets we'll be able to sell at the market. And now we look at what the low price we'd like to take for them and what's the high price. And we record that information. We actually do that with every crop we have in that high tunnel. Here you can see we've got it for our, our Russian kale, our curly kale, and our Swiss chard. We know that with plants on eight inch centers, how many plants we're going to put out there. So that helps us with our planting guide when we're actually seeding in the greenhouse. We know that on the day we want to transplant those, these are the number of plants we want to have to be able to carry up there to put in the ground. We also know that we can take two leaves per plant per week. We're going to put 16 leaves in a bunch. That's going to give us a half pound bunch. So that determines how many bunches a week we can produce and for how many weeks. We actually do this for every crop we have. This is on lettuce. This is for tomatoes. This is on peppers. But basically, we've built a chart that tells us, OK, these are our potential sales from that spring planted high tunnel. And the only difference between the two columns is the price we're trying to set. I would really like to suggest ask a high price. It's much easier to reduce a price than it is to raise a price. I mean, the one thing I think you don't want to encounter is that you go to a market and by 930 you have sold out of the product you brought. And then you've got a question, boy, could I have gotten another dollar an item for it? What I find is that I try to ask the highest price I think I can command. If they don't sell, then boy, at 10 o'clock, I'll grab that sale sign, draw a red line through it and say sale today and reduce it. I mean, that seems to work. People always love a sale. What I find is you don't want to sell out early 
and next week try to come back and raise your price because customers seem to notice that and, and it's hard to work that way. In order to do that, we work in what's called a loadout sheet. So every week, depending upon what we're producing, we have a chart, uh, whether it's written on a, a whiteboard and then gets transferred over onto a tablet, you know, whatever works well for you. So that week, every item we're taking to market gets recorded. We record the, the date that we're going to the market, and now we record every item and how many. And they're recorded in our sales unit. So if we're selling something by a bunch, if we're selling something by a head, if we're selling something by the pound, that's how it's recorded. Where you see that red dollar sign, that is actually where we record the price we're asking for it at the market that day. It's a little hard to get all this information onto the slide, so we're leaving that column blank. Then at the end of the market, we record what we're bringing back in. Some markets will actually do this as we're loading back in. Other times we'll do it when we get home. And if we're if we have time and we sell out of an item, we actually try to record when that occurred. That kind of gives us some idea. I mean, selling out of an item, if the market closes at 12 and you sold out the item at 11 o'clock, I'm not going to die over that. But when you sell out at 9 o'clock or 9.40, that may be saying, hey, you know, maybe I really need to buy more of it. And then we also try to make comments on it. You know, uh, a few years ago, I think in the first either 10 or 12 markets, we had either rain or freezing rain or snow in like nine of those first markets. And our sales really suffered. But going back on the records, that made it obvious to us, okay, this wasn't something we were doing that was purely weather related. But having things like that, or maybe your market is doing a festival that wet day and your sales have really increased, you know, you may want to note that also. It, it just So that way, if your market's running that same festival every year, you may know to try to target that date for extra sales. Then we sit down and it's pretty simple. You know, you subtract column two from column one and that's going to tell us exactly what we've sold. But it tells us a lot of things. You know, right here, okay, you know, for instance, pak choy. You know, we brought 24 heads to market. We brought back 22 heads, okay? Tot soy, we brought 12, we brought back nine. What this is telling us, if this trend continues, we either have to step up our marketing of those items or reconsider planting those and substituting something else that we have better sales on. Here's another one. Let's look at uh, green romaine. Okay, we sold 24 heads, but we sold out by 10 o'clock. But in our oak leaf lettuces, we sold just a little bit more than half. So if that continues as a trend, what I would say is, what if I cut back, maybe instead of setting out 12 heads, maybe just set out six heads and bump up my green romaine by another dozen heads? I think I could sell it. But this is the way using a sheet like this really helps you tweak. Okay? Now, carrots, I mean, for me, that's pretty typical. I sell a lot of bunches of carrots and I sell out early. But I also know there are a lot of work digging, washing, bunching them. That's uh, physically exhausting. So for myself, I recognize, okay, people, you just be happy with getting 65 bunches, and that's it. When they're gone, they're gone. If you want them, show up early. And they do. Yeah. And it also tells me I can keep my price pretty high on it, keep it at a premium. But this type of information really helps you uh, establish a production plan and keeps you moving in the right direction. The other thing I like to say is uh, don't ever fall in love with a specific seed. Um, I cannot tell you over the last 20 years how many times we have a variety that is just, oh, it's just fabulous. I mean, it does so well in a high tunnel, and we fall in love, and it's highly productive, and two years later, nobody has it anymore. Um, now you've got a problem. Uh, it, it's, so what, what are you going to grow this year? So for us, we're constantly experimenting. Every time we put out our cucumbers, we're going to have one or two varieties. We'll put them in the same flats when we seed them. We'll put them right in and mark what plants they are in our high tunnels so we can evaluate exactly what varieties are going to do well side by side. That means if we have to fall back on something else, it's much easier to do it. 
uh, that happens to be one of the early tomatoes that we fell in love with that's no longer available. I mean, it produced a 16 to 20 some odd ounce fabulous slicer week after week. Um, when we lost that, it was a uh, terrible. Peppers, I mean, you can pull some beautiful produce out of your high tunnels. Uh, here we find a picture. These are our peppers. What I love about pepper production in a high tunnel is one, the size, you get a feel for how large they are. The green and the red, that happens to be King Arthur. And again, uh, our farm, we have no problem with bacterial leaf spot. It is resistant. I'm going to say to race one and two, perhaps three. If BLS is a problem on your farm, this would not be a variety you would want to grow. Um, the yellow is, is flavor burst. And, and it's highly productive. And again, look at the nice size we're getting on those. And believe it or not, that basket of jalapenos there, that was our part of our yield. There's more set back off of five plants. Uh, it's just absolutely unbelievable, the sheer quantity and quality. Out in the field, I figure I can harvest a pure ripe pepper, maybe 15% can be harvested like that. That means, you know, so it's it's not green on red or, or green and yellow. It is pure color. Whereas in my high tunnel, in most years, I'm harvesting anywhere from 85 to the low 90% with them being beautifully ripened like that. And the other thing is you can carry peppers all the way through. Um, we actually have them at our market uh, just about up to Christmas. The only reason they don't go to Christmas is usually by then I'm so tired of them. I leave a high uh, a sidewall open so the cold will kill them. So that just gives you an idea of some of the beautiful, high quality product that comes out of our high tunnels. So again, thank you for joining with us tonight. Now we're going to turn it over to our other guest speakers. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate it. Now we're going to move on to working with the Henkels uh, from Nicholasville, Kentucky, and they're going to talk a little bit about their uh, experience over the past several years. Good evening, everyone. Um, our business uh, is my, mine and my wife, Mark and Velvet. We're uh, Henkels Herbs and Heirlooms. Uh, we do about, uh, it's, it gets crazier every year, we do about 100 varieties of tomatoes at least. I just seeded 37 varieties of peppers the other day, uh, multiple eggplants. Uh, herbs, lettuces, got some blackberries, uh, but it's, uh, uh, anyway, our, our business began in uh, 2006. Uh, we are in Jessamine County. That's our uh, big work truck there. You'll see us at the market, and you also see uh, there's, a, there's a catering business that my wife has, but it's kind of fallen to the wayside. We, we do a little bit in the winter, but the, the farming has, has taken over considerably. Um, we uh, we, I say no pesticides. We use, I mean, we use BT and this and that, but we try and combat um, any insects uh, problems with beneficial insects, and I will speak about that a little bit later. And uh, here we are. Uh, this is, it's like I said, it's the two of us mainly. Uh, we get a little bit of help. We had one helper for a couple of months last year, but uh, primarily it is the two of us doing all the work. There's me making a, a restaurant delivery and Velvet with a golf cart load of tomatoes there. She'll uh, she'll stay home during the weekday markets and uh, and pick, but and, and I will go during the week. But it's it's the two of us on on the weekends. And here's a shot of us at our um, our previous location on uh, on Saturday. There's been a little bit of construction down at the courthouse now, but that was at the corner of Short and Upper <clears throat> with some of our produce. We sell at the uh, Lexington Farmers Market. Uh, there's Sunday uh, Sunday Tuesday. Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, in the peak of the season. Um, we, we're very happy with that market. And uh, we, uh, we also sell to uh, some local restaurants. And uh, with our uh, catering business, we have a certified kitchen. And we also make fresh salsa out of our, our tomatoes um, and, and fresh ingredients. Um, and I'm going to talk about our, our high tunnel. We... Uh, we uh, uh, we uh, got our equip funds for this, and uh, we built it in uh, 2012. Our first planting was in uh, 2013. I know a lot of people will opt to the 30 by 72, but we went ahead and, and did the 30 by 96. And uh, we primarily uh, grow early tomatoes for, for the market in here. And I'm going to talk about how we constructed it and some of the things we encountered. 
I purchased, uh, we purchased our, our high tunnel from Martins uh, in uh, Casey County. Very uh, reasonable, very uh, good quality structures. And uh, here on the uh, upper left, we've got uh, where we have the posts driven and the bows assembled. Um, those, uh, those posts are not a whole lot of fun to drive in the ground, and don't get me started on tech screws. It's a lot of work, but um, it, it ends up the, the end result is very rewarding. Uh, on the bottom right there, you can see where we have our, uh, our trusses up. Like I said, these structures from Martins are very sturdy. Uh, can with hand, with, with, uh, stand the snow loads. We had uh, a 14 inch snow and followed by a 17 inch snow and this thing shedded, shedded all the snow and, and the, the gothic really is, is the way to go to, to shed the snow load and like I said with the, with the trusses as well. Uh, here I had uh, the, the labor for this, it was with, I, I speak about the, the um, Martin's kits, the, the, the quality is there, the uh, instructions left a little bit to be desired. It was four hand-drawn pages, and uh, luckily I had the help of, um, of uh, my mentor's uh, grandson, Bill Best, uh, and uh, his son, uh, grandson Brian. And Brian would come over and give me a hand, and uh, and we got it, got it all together. But with the help of uh, some friends uh, up there, we we ended up going with. Uh, uh, I know you have uh, scaffolding that, that has rollers on it, but the neighbor had some uh, that, was, that was free for us to use. So we just put it on the back of the of the um, trailer there and just went along. And here we are getting the, the purlins up. Uh, and then another thing that came with the kit, uh, this is a uh, double channel uh, wire lock. Let's try this. That's not going to work. Okay. Uh, right around in here, it's a, it's a, so it's instead of a, a hip board with uh, the wood, it's, it affixes directly to the, to the edge, and it's got your double channel wire lock, so you're not going to ever be replacing that again. And, uh, and then our, our tow board here. Uh, we got our lumber from a place in Cynthiana called Tri County Lumber, and it, it was, uh, the, the wood was all cut to length. Everything was great. Nothing was short. Uh, six 16 foot boards here on the bottom. I was very happy with their, with their product. And uh, on the, uh, the end walls, the end walls were not included in the kit, but uh, Neil and Aaron at uh, South Farm were nice enough to uh, and advise me on some, uh, some, some ways to frame these in. So they gave me some good uh, ideas on this. And we got our, um, our end walls framed there. So here, this is our, so this is, uh, I, I, there's Bill Best up on top of the truck there. Uh, he's, a, he's a great uh, resource. Uh, uh, really renowned around this area, um, really great guy and great friend, and uh, his son, uh, grandson Brian over there on the right that helped me construct it, and dad, and that's our, our truck there, um, uh, as well as bringing uh, produce to the market and everything, it works great to to use for, uh, for, for putting plastic on. So anyway, uh, I didn't anticipate Bill being up on the top, but I turned around and he climbed up on the ladder and he's ready to go. So I've helped him put, I've helped him, I actually I worked for him when I um, went back to UK in, uh, in uh, 2003, I guess it was. Uh, I did an internship with him in 2005, so I worked for him all summer, and he taught me a tremendous amount. And anyway, that was my first exposure to high tunnels. And uh, so I, uh, I worked with him, and I've helped him put the plastic on a couple of his, so he, he was nice enough to come and, and return the favor. So what we ended up doing was just ran it. Ran it out, ran it over the truck, and Bill just kind of guided it over the top, and we we were able to pull it over, and it really didn't take that long. It's it was we had a night. This, this was we did this. It was December, I believe it was December first or second of 2012, and it really wasn't uh, that windy. This is a very windy site that we're on, uh, so I was very fortunate with that. And there, after the first layer. My wife felt it, told Bill to, to smile, and he obliged up there. We got a good picture of him up on the truck. Can't say enough good things about him. Um, okay, here we are applying the second second layer. Went right on like butter. It was it was it was great. Got it all got it all done. And uh, there we are. Uh, once that we got uh, some some trim there, I came back a few days later and got my ends on. <clears throat> and for the for the door, of course we've got the roll up sides, but the uh, the uh, ventilation on the other ends, I went with a barn style door. Uh, South Farm, I got this idea uh, from them as well, and we uh, we framed framed it up and used uh, barn door rails 
and cut the polycarbonate and it's an eight by eight rough opening. Initially, we I, I made the eight by eight opening thinking about getting you know a tractor in there with the with the tiller and this and that, but it's it's uh, thirty by ninety six. I can till with my my Troy built horse no problem at all. You know, in half an hour and get it all turned over. So and, and you don't deal with the issues of compaction. Um, and the uh, another thing that I added. Uh, anticipating, you know, ventilation and, and uh, possible disease problems, we put in four horizontal airflow fans uh, as just a way just to, to get, get some good ventilation going and cool down a little bit in the summer and hopefully um, uh, cut down on the moisture. But uh, there we are on the on the bottom right finished product. Uh, this is an interesting little story. Uh, when we got our soil test results back, we needed to apply some lime, and the neighbors across the street had just done uh, geothermal at their home, and they had piles and piles of lime. So we gathered up wheelbarrow loads and, and uh, buckets full, and, and we were able to, to use that. It doesn't get any more local for a source of lime than, than across the street, which was nice. And uh, another good thing, you can see the snow on the top here. It hasn't quite shed off here yet, but... And you can see over here where it's snowing outside. It's great for it to be miserable outside, and you can go hang out in your high tunnel and work, and, and it's, it's just a great environment to work in. We're, we're really happy with ours. <clears throat> so here we are in our, our planting day. This was April 2nd of last year. We uh, started our, our uh, plants in a greenhouse, and then uh, what we do is we'll run lines. We've got a four-foot spacing. We can get 60 plants per row and seven rows total. And we, we, uh, we uh, dig the holes usually with a post hole digger, and we plant our plants very deep. One thing we did notice, we don't plant the cherry tomatoes as deep because they'll start to set fruit right on the ground and the ants show up and, and make a mess. And you got to take care of the ants too because they'll eat your beneficial insects, which I'll get to later. Here we are. We uh, So we plant our, um, our tomatoes and then we mulch them. We've got a tree service that's nice enough to drop off their, uh, their mulch on our farm. And I've already had the conversation, please don't bring me black walnut or you know, miss a couple of uh, trips if you, if you have harvested any. But they bring it, and we let it uh, break down for a couple of years, and then we mulch all of our plants. And we also do this in the field. We'll, we'll plant uh, on, on plastic, on raised beds, and then once that we plant, we come through, put a good uh, scoop of mulch in there, and, and uh, helps with the weeds and uh, soil moisture and, and everything, all that good stuff. So, of course, everything is great. You're looking good. You've got your, your high tunnel planted, and then you get a, a – Notice that it's going to be 25 degrees, you know, where velvet was in shorts in the picture a couple days before that, where it was 70. So we ended up covering everything with row covers and keeping our fingers crossed. And the next shot here is that's about three, three or four in the morning. We went down to uh, refire the kerosene heaters. The pipes were frozen. The, 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 all the, all the um, interior, the steel was covered in ice. The whole, pl all the plastic inside was covered in ice. I had a thermometer on the top of the, the row cover. It was 32 degrees, but fortunately, everything survived. And that's happened. That's in the, in the two years that we've done that, it's happened both years. It's about two weeks after. It's right about tax day. About two weeks after we get it planted, um, uh, it's, uh, that we get that. And that's a neat little shot from outside with the moon rising. And you can see the, the, the ice build up on here. And uh, so anyway, after the, after the frost scare, plants growing here a little bit, I ended up using, I used 10 foot tall posts. I found, uh, I was on a tour of the South Farm and I saw those posts and, and uh, we, we grow a lot, of, a lot of heirloom varieties. We grow a lot of cherry tomatoes, a lot of indeterminates that will just get huge. And the 10 foot posts, I was buying, you know, seven footers and then graduated to eight footers. And I, for the last two years, I'm, I'm not going back to anything other than 10 feet. We spaced them. Uh, I was spacing them every five. I'll do a um, metal, and then uh, every two plants was putting a wooden 
Uh, but we, I, I ended up spacing, uh, I was doing metal and then five wooden and then metal, but now I'm doing uh, metal every third uh, spacing. And then as for weed control, we will use white uh, to cut down on the heat uh, coming up. But this was the, one of the first years, well, I'm going to do it for two, but the first couple years, we had some of this landscape fabric and we ran it uh, in the middle because if you don't cover that ground and there are weeds in there, you're lucky to get a running start to get through when the plants are big and there's no way you would get a tiller through. And um, another thing, we'd had some disease problems, some uh, powdery mildew, some uh, anchor, what was it, uh, stem canker. And anyway, I'd, uh, what we're gonna do this year is we're going to end up putting down the plastic mulch in between to uh, prevent that evaporation of water that's, that's uh, the humidity causing your disease problems. And there is the high tunnel, and uh, that is roughly, I believe, around uh, June, mid-June, early July. This high tunnel, the first year we just let it go, we did a lot of, lot of it was, we had to have one of everything. It seemed we, I think there were 13 varieties of cherry tomatoes, and of course the tournaments on the outside, and this and that, but kind of learn our lesson on, on planting as many varieties in there, but we were picking this until I guess about three or four weeks after frost. We were still getting production. It was it had definitely hit beyond the point of diminishing returns, but we went ahead and went for it and were able to still bring tomatoes later than, uh, than a lot of people at the market. And there's a shot, the outside with the sides rolled up, and that's a uh, cover crop of buckwheat that we put in uh, to enrich the soil as well as to uh, try and draw in as many beneficial insects as possible. And this is a, this is a, a project that we did for, um, for a greenhouse that is another new addition. I know we're talking about high tunnels, but I think that some of the aspects of this boiler will definitely benefit uh, high tunnel growers if you have um, uh, firewood on your farm. Or you know, if, it's, if you have free access to it, it's it's a great way to to, um, to heat. So so here's our well. This so this is a a, a woodshed and a, and the boiler. So it's a nine foot deep, uh, twenty seven foot long, and uh, they uh, had, had someone build it for me. We actually got some money through the county, the Kate funds, as well as the governor's office of ag policy uh, on farm energy efficiency, and uh, they they helped us. Uh, uh, finance some of this, but here we are with our framed up uh, woodshed and, and pad for the boiler. <clears throat> and so it involves digging digging a trench for the the tubing that will go underground that will will take the water warm water for hot water from the boiler and then circulate it back to the boiler to refire and then go back. So there is our are the um, our, uh, Greg and his worker helping us uh, dig a dig a trench. And this is this is the tubing. So it's a it's thick. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's thick insulated on the outside. It has a um, a foam interior, and then we ended up using one inch uh, tubing in the middle. It's three quarter inch in the greenhouse, but the the larger size actually uh, helped with the heat loss from the the two layers of poly. But there we are running running it down, <clears throat> and uh, you'll see this corner right here in the next slide. Uh, and but that's uh, that's is where we were, were just starting to build the greenhouse. And so one of the means to, to heat, one of the zones you can use, this is a heat exchanger. So uh, the uh, hot water will come in at the top pipe here, circulate through the wiggly copper coils, and then kick back out of the bottom and be returned to the boiler to, to reheat again. So th this is that pipe I was just talking about that we were down, down in the trench that's coming up. So, so I've done uh, multiple heating zones here. That's a neat thing you can do with the boiler. And this is a um, this is a hot water heater. This is just a storage tank. It, it does not have electricity to it. It's just a means to store hot water. This is our we have a uh, three compartment sink that we have in, so we can sterilize all of our trays. We try and get it, you know as many uses as we can out of our trays before they get brittle and broken down by the UV. And we, in fact, I was washing some today. Um, and so we've got all the hot water that we that we need as well as um, it allows you to, there's a little valve on here, it allows you to temper the water so that, you know, the water that's coming out of the tap right now, I, I washed, we, we were 
planting, seeding lettuce in the field yesterday, and there was some spinach that was still there, and Velvet cut down as much as she could uh, to, before we tilled it in and, and uh, planted some more seed, but when I was washing that lettuce last night, my hands were about numb from the, the water was so cold, so that's a very, very good aspect to, to be able to, another another thing, and the, the latest that we've done over here on the right is we have some, it's a finned tubing, so it's a copper tubing with fins all over, it's for radiant heat, so we put uh, a couple of those underneath each of the tables, and then so those areas there we can use to germinate the seeds as well as if, if uh, you know, it's early in the season, this is a pretty, it's a 30 by 96 foot greenhouse, it's a lot to heat, if I'm just starting a few things, I can actually just heat with bottom heat, and then the radiant heat that's coming off the heat exchanger is enough to keep, to keep the plants warm enough to, to still, uh, to, you know, stay alive, but, but still be nice and, nice and warm underneath, and then t uh, closely uh, putting all the flats together like this really holds all of it in, and it's, it's, it's really nice. I, I've, I've got a lot more of this tubing. We're going to run it along the perimeter eventually, but uh, another, another thing that we used for the, the boiler for the heating zones was a snow melter, and we had this, this uh, greenhouse here is a Quonset, so it's, it's circular on the top. It actually is kind of almost flat on the top, and when you get heavy snow, it will just sit on there, so we ran some lines. Uh, this is just straight up three-quarter inch PEX tubing. I'll probably end up taking it out and, and replacing it eventually with the finned uh, tubing, just two runs of it. It, it, it uh, generates a little bit more heat, but this was enough to save our, our uh, greenhouse from collapse from the, the, the 14 inch and the 17 inch snowfall that we got. And also provides a little bit, a little bit extra heat in there for you. And there is our finished, finished project with the, with the boiler. And we ran another, we ran another four foot stack on top of there so that it would draw better. And uh, all I will say is we have burned so much wood this winter, but it, it's a, it's toasty in there, and I, I really enjoy it, and I really uh, uh, enjoy not having to be tethered to um, fluctuating fuel prices. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to touch briefly on here on, on fighting some good bugs with bad bugs. We, uh, we release a lot of lady beetles. I, I imagine we're going to probably have to release a lot this year, although hopefully a lot of the bad bugs were killed as well. But... On a warm year, a lot of them will come back. But I, I purchased all of my bugs and get a lot of advice from, uh, her name is uh, Blair Lino Helvey. She is uh, of uh, um, Entomology Solutions in Louisville. And she is very helpful. She can uh, recommend whatever, uh, 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 she'll recommend a solution for whatever your problem is. Um, so like I said, we released a lot of lace wings, or a lot of lace wings as well. Uh, the, uh, on your right there, if you look closely, you'll see the uh, lace wing eggs. That, that's on a tag, a market tag there uh, for, it's like a, what is it, green brown berry, brown berry uh, tomato. And those are on, if, if you, once that you see them, you see them everywhere. You see the eggs on, on tomato twine. You see them on tomatoes at the market. Uh, I mean, they, they will lay those on everywhere, but that is one of the greatest signs because the lace rings are such voracious predators uh, as adults as well as in their, uh, their larval stage. We got some. Yeah, in fact, we've seen we've seen some, and I saw one flying around in my truck the other day. Uh, so uh, here, and so this was the first the first year that we planted in the high tunnel. Uh, everything was looking great, and then I noticed some aphid infestation. So I called up Blair, and she sent me these cards. So you break these little cards off, and then the little collar you put them around uh, around the plant where you're seeing some insects, and uh, you uh, put them on there, and then they're right there ready for the buffet. You can see on the, the top right, there's a one right here, there's a, a larva that's crawling around. So these cards have got eggs on them. There's, a, you know, there's newly hatching ones. There's some that are a little bit further behind. So you've got multiple stages here to, to feast on the bad bugs, aphids in this case. Another thing, we, ha we uh, uh, have a lot of the uh, bracketed wasps around. If you, if you see the, uh, the tomato hornworm, and he's like this, where, he's, where he doesn't have them on him. Just I, we organically squish them, take them out that way. But if you see any of these that are completely covered, leave them there. That's a factory for, for more of these bugs. I I find that if I see if I see a couple of these in our in our area, it's pretty much control of all hornworms for the whole the whole garden, the whole the whole operation. 
Another thing we we uh, uh, put out were beneficial nematodes. These, yeah, you get them. They're on a little sponge, and uh, you, keep, you keep them moist. And anyway, you just toss them. We tossed them in a barrel here, and then we just injected them with the trickle irrigation through a fertilizer injector, and that'll take care of some soil soil um, problems, problem insects, but uh, it works well. And uh, more beneficials, these are uh, predatory mites that we sprinkled around the greenhouse when we constructed it, and we put them underneath the, uh, the fabric over the gravel inside the greenhouse and sprinkled them throughout the high tunnel also. And uh, this is a thrips eliminator and another uh, mite preventer. Um, we saw some of the russet mite in some greenhouse tomatoes last year, so we, we added, added those. And uh, the thrips eliminator was a precaution. Hadn't seen any of those yet. And uh, another thing we released were the aphetolites, and uh, and uh, the mantids are everywhere. That's a that's a shot on one of our tomato posts. Uh, there was one in one of those underneath the table in the greenhouse as well. So if you see if you see these weird looking things, just leave them on there. They're going to hatch out in the spring and and give you free bugs to to, to eat the bad bugs. So once all that uh, hard work is over, here we are loaded up and uh, ready to go to the market. Uh, like I said, we're at the Lexington Farmers Market as, as often as we can go from, from April until, uh, what did we go with, with tomatoes? November. Until the 15th of November. And in fact, it was so cold, they were almost freezing on the table. So it's good. It gets, but, but by then, I was, I was ready to, to wind it down. And here's a shot. This is from the uh, Saturday Market downtown, and I believe the, of all the, the multiple varieties of tomatoes that we do. We're, we're kind of the tomato people at the market, although... Uh, we grow. I mean, we grow other things as well. We're we're pretty well versed in the the multiple varieties of tomatoes. We definitely go overboard, but we we love them. And uh, this is the uh, Sunday market at uh, at Southland Drive. Another another table display there. A lot of aromas too. We do a lot of aroma varieties. And uh, but yeah, on the on the whole high tunnel thing, I we are we are hooked. The the um, quality of the produce that you get, the um, the disease control, you know, on a rainy year, it will really save you just keeping uh, all of the uh, condensation, all the rain and everything off of the leaves. Uh, it, it, we're, we're sold on them. In fact, we've got another one that we are constructing. We're, uh, we're going to, it, the kit came with, it came with a, a ridge vent. So we're going to um, have one roll up side and a ridge vent, and hopefully that will eliminate the four horizontal airflow fans, but it should definitely eliminate the heat buildup that you do experience in the, in the peak of the summer. But, yeah, I, I, uh, I can't say enough good things about the protected culture and the, the high, tunnel, high tunnels in general. I'm very happy with them. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mark. I uh, really appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate all of you. So thank you so much for all your wonderful presentations this evening. I also want to direct um, your attention to the web links pod um, in the bottom of your screen. I did include a link to the Weediger's Farm website as well as that Facebook page uh, that Mark just mentioned is available there. You should be able to click on it and it'll take you right to it in your browser. Um, so before we get to the question and answer session, I just want to draw your attention to some of the resources that are available to you from the Center for Crop Diversification and the University of Kentucky. First, this entire webinar series has been recorded and is available on our, the Center for Crop Diversification website. We have created a new page exclusively for webinars, so you should be easily able to navigate to the page and find recordings along with the handouts and other resources mentioned during each of the uh, presentations. Again, I'd also like to thank our sponsors for making this series possible. Um, it's really been a great series uh, working to put it together, and uh, I know I've gotten a lot of great feedback already um, from people across the state. So thank you for participating, and uh, we hope we'll be able to offer more programs like this in the future. Um, so the Center for Crop Diversification also has several high tunnel specific resources, and they are available on our website as well. Um, there's a quick link right there on that um, page, uh, but you should be able to find them just on our crop profiles um, page on our website. Um, we also do have quite a few organic crop profiles, so I just wanted to touch just a minute on that to uh, show you all the variety of crops that we do have some organic growing information for here in Kentucky uh, specifically, um, and just thought that might be of interest to some of you folks. Um, 
Also, just please find us on the web and take some time to look through all of the resources that we have available. Even just this screenshot, you can see there's a lot going on on our website. Uh, we talked about price reports during several of the um, webinars. Those are available, a specific page dedicated to that. We also have a lot of different marketing information available. Um, so uh, get on there and check it out. Search around and see what you can find. If you're having trouble, though, contact me or Christy Cassidy. Her uh, contact information is on all the web pages. Uh, and don't hesitate to contact us. We'd be happy to help you. Um, and finally, the UK High Tunnel Research Facility maintains a great website of what they are up to at the UK Horticulture Research Farm, and they provide links to other great resources that will be helpful to you. Uh, Dr. Krista Jacobson sort of manages that, and she was a speaker for a couple of these uh, webinars as well. So. Um, with that, I hope you've learned a lot from this series, and we welcome any feedback about the series. Uh, you are welcome to email me with comments, suggestions, and questions. And also, please help us this one last time uh, by filling out a survey related to the entire series, uh, not just this uh, one webinar. So with that, thank you very much, and we will um, be moving into questions. So it looks like the first one here is, who was the, la the bug lady in Louisville? It's, uh, her name is Blair. And uh, you can, her website is bugsbehavingbadly.com, and the name of her business is Entomology Solutions. Is bugs behaving badly? Mm -hmm. And she's very friendly, very helpful. Great resource. Okay, great. So we don't have a whole lot of questions right now. Um, we put them off, please. Yeah. No, I don't think so. It, it just gives lots of great information, um, I'm sure. Um, so let's see. Is there anything else you guys want to throw out there while we're personally yeah, I something just, else you're thinking about as we went through this? We're bugs and all. And I, I just find that so fascinating, right? I've just been doing research lately on aphids. I mean, especially in winter high tunnels, and even for tomatoes, you really see a lot of issues with aphids. In my opinion, especially in winter high tunnels, it is the number one problem. And and I find it, uh, it's a real issue, right? There's, there's, high tunnels here are still in your infancy, right? So you get a lot of, you know, when we talk about good bugs versus bad bugs, and although there are some great predators out there to dealing with aphids during warm weather, it doesn't work as well during cool weather. And it definitely, then you also want to look at, at crops. Uh, I mean, dealing with aphids uh, using uh, uh, predatory insects on tomatoes is great, but you definitely don't want to do that on, let's say, leafy greens because parasitoids, sorry, that, that, that it's, uh, it's easy to wash aphids off of leafy greens, but trying to wash an aphid mummy off of something like lettuce is really hard to do. It must have super glue. And it's, uh, but I can think, I mean, why do you see this huge insect explosion? And I started doing research on it, and it's basically that, so here in the South, all aphids are, are females. They all give live birth, and the newborns are all born already pregnant. So somewhere around seven days after being born, they start reproducing. So the other day, believe it or not, I'm sitting down, I'm doing the math on it, and I figure out, well, if three aphids walk into your high tunnel on March 1st and you were not to do anything about it, by April 1st, you'll have a million aphids in your high tunnel. That's how fast the population explosion occurs. And you see them in clusters of about 100. You, know. you do. Yeah, yeah. But what we really see, and I find this fascinating, in our high tunnels, and, and for years we've observed this, it seems that they love red Russian kale. We do mixed kale plantings, right? So in, in one uh, bed, we'll have, and it's all together, we'll have uh, like curly kale, white Russian kale, wild garden kales, La Sonata kale. But if having, a, let's say, one red Russian kale every here and there really adds a lot of color to your kale mix, right? But the other day I was going through it, I mean, looking to plants, and that no aphids, no aphids, no aphids. And again, these plants are, eight inches on center, right? They're tightly grown. And you turn over the lower leaves on the red Russian kale, and they're covered up. Okay, every leaf, maybe 100 to 300 aphids per leaf. But after you get about four leaves up, they're gone. So you just break off those very lower leaves, like put them in a bucket or whatever, spritz it real quick with a little, say, for soap or whatever, 
and you almost eliminate the entire aphid population. And I've seen it over so many years, it's actually to the point where I feel like when I'm putting in a tomato crop, I think I'm going to actually plant a few red Russian kale here and there amongst the tomatoes to use it as my indicators for aphid infestation, knowing that one, once I see them showing up on there, I can take out those leaves, which may stop that influx from happening and really hold down the pressure I have later on. But I find it absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> I did not know until earlier today when you talked about aphids how quickly they multiply. Yeah, it's crazy. You we, go by and it's just like, huh. Oh, it's yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> you know, and, and for years, you know, you'd see it and you think, well, you know, I don't think I saw hardly any in here a week ago, right? And now yeah. it's a, and, and then eventually you think, well, what, what, why is that? What's going on there? But it's amazing how rapid the reproduction yeah. is. Crazy. They get so thick on like once they get there, it's just like all of a sudden you're just like you grab it and it's just like, oh my gosh. So once you see them, they're everywhere. Yeah. And they're in yeah. colonies, it seems yeah. like. Yeah. Yeah. So we do have a question. Can either one of you make an estimate of pounds of tomatoes per square foot of high tunnel? I'll let you handle that one. <laughs> well, say, a, a lot of that is variety specific, okay? Yeah. Because I can say like on and I'm sure it really varies from, from hybrid varieties to, to heirloom varieties. I know on, on many of our hybrid varieties that we're doing for early market, a typical yield in three weeks is somewhere between 10 and a half to a little over 12 pounds per plant. We're doing our, our planting on, on 22 inch centers. You guys use an 18? Yes, yeah, so what it look like. Yeah, so you know, that just gives you some idea of. But that's 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 a for a rule of thumb for early tomatoes that that pretty much holds true. But since we don't plant a whole tunnel to them, our tunnels are very diverse. The impacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we noticed that the first year we did we did um, tomatoes and then we did a row of egg, eggplant and peppers. Yeah. And we found that we made more money on we, we've made more money on them. Well, there were more quantity there, but we, the tomatoes seemed to do better, and we got more out of the real estate there. Uh, but now we're, we, we did, I think the first year, what was it, like 40 varieties of tomatoes? Yeah, you know, it was like six of this, eight of that. So, you know, there were 13 were varieties of cherry tomatoes. And uh, so it was just kind of really a learning experience. This year, I think we have, uh, there's, there's seven, there, I think there's, well, with the cherry tomatoes, excluding them, it's one row of this, one row of that, you know, and it's, and it's 60 day, 63 day varieties. It's not trying to get heirlooms, you know, that, that are 90 day varieties. You know, because you're trying to hit that early market window. That's the yeah. whole name of the game. Yeah, my opinion is, I mean, and, and even, you know, whether you do hybrid or you do heirloom, I think coming to market early, that establishes yourself. So then as your heirlooms come on, people already know you've got a high quality tomato. Right. I think what always impresses me is people talk about how, how high quality the early tomatoes are. Because especially if you're picking good varieties, they have that summer tomato taste to them. So people get used to buying those from you, you know, let's say the month of June. So when the market really begins to get flooded July and August with tomatoes, those customers are still coming back to you to buy because they've already gotten that quality from you. But in my opinion, it, it just, I think hitting that early tomato crop, for us it was key early on. Now, now I think that may change down the road, especially with more and more NRCS high tunnels going up. Uh, I know in the southeastern United States, well, they estimate 85% of the high tunnels are producing tomato crops, right? So at some point, there's going to be more competition at the market for that. But that's when I think, you know, uh, uh, variety goes in there. I've seen a lot of success the last few years doing uh, peppers, mainly because, again, I can bring in these beautiful ripe peppers. I can bring them in early and run them till Christmas time. So even during the, the main season where a lot of other growers have them, it seems because of the variety of colors I have and the quality I can still maintain a premium price but then especially September October November December when all the outside plantings you know especially the November December they're gone so you're the only one with these colored peppers and it really can drive sales that late. Well I think you also have to, to realize that well, we can only sell so many pounds of tomatoes. I mean, we go to a relatively small market, mm -hmm. and we can only sell so many pounds of tomatoes. So if we put five rows of tomatoes in our high tunnels, we would be harvesting probably two thirds of what we could sell. Okay, that makes a big difference. Yeah, too. yeah. Our market, we do well with this. Yeah, we do. We've got the we've got the high tunnel, mm -hmm. and then we we have um we did some greenhouse ones. 
and then uh, we have we have a uh, two field plantings, and and then this we've got this new high tunnel that we're going to do tomatoes. Like I said, we're kind of known known for the tomato varieties, and uh, but yeah, just the uh, I I spoke earlier about once that you know once that you pick out of the high tunnel and then you go to the field. It's just it's such a drag. I mean, you know, you're you're picking everything's perfect, yeah. everything's gorgeous, and then you're just like, you're, oh my gosh, I've got, you know, I picked five trays and there's a tray and a half of the same same quality. You know, you don't you don't get the cracking, you don't get the cat facing, you don't get the disease, you don't get the foliar problems, you know, that, that you seem to get in the field. We actually got pigs, so that we had something to do with. Yeah. Uh -huh. To make it fit work good enough to go to market. But but I think that comment is really a good one to touch on. Uh, I know early on when we were one of the first high tunnel producers, we wound up actually even taking our coals to market just to prove we were growing the other tomatoes, yeah, right? Yeah. And we found we had a market for the coals because people said, well, that's still a half decent tomato, yeah. so we could sell even yeah. those, right? But, but I agree to that. I, I mean, we have a picture. We don't have it as a slide. It's an actual photo of years and years ago. We have picked up Whole, like first harvest out of our high tunnel, the whole truck is full of these two and a half gallon buckets of these beautiful tomatoes. It was picture was up there, I think. And in this one corner, there's just a handful of tomatoes, and those are all the ones that aren't perfect. Mm -hmm. All right, and it was just like, oh my goodness, you know, out in the field, if you're picking 50% going to market, you're feeling pretty good. In a high tunnel, if I'm picking less than 95%. I've had a problem with my management uh, issues, right? That that's it's just amazing. And there is a market for coals. We do yeah, great market. with our coals. I mean, we uh, we call them uglies with goodies. Yeah. And, yes, and we yes, I mean, and we sell so many of those. And and you know, and in the peak of the summer, uh, I mean, if you're canning, if you're if you're making soup sauce, I mean, who's gonna know? I mean, exactly. And that's it's such a bargain. And you know, we give quantity discounts. Mm -hmm. And uh, but yeah, we uh, that's that's one of our most popular things. Yeah, you know, people, people will be like, "You're out of ugly." Yeah, so we have people that come to the stand and they're like, "No, oh, they can't all be gone already." <laughs> they're like, "They go fast." Yeah, that's what we we had ugly tomatoes. <laughs> yes, right. Where'd your ugly tomatoes go? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, they're all fine. I think always felt bad about the fact that actually, if you looked at the price, that actually it wasn't a good deal. It, it, we were getting enough for it that when you look at how much you were going to have to cut out. You would have been better off buying the number one tomato, yeah. right? But that's people love bargains. So and, and some people that. they they won't buy them unless they're ugly. You yes. know, they're if they're they're if they're perfect, there has to be something wrong with them, right. you know, they're or they're modified somehow. But uh, but yeah, there's you meet all kinds of people. You do. <laughs> <laughs> the joy and the fear. <laughs> uh, well, that's really great. Thank you for that great answer. I did want to talk just quickly about some of the amendments you guys both put on your in your high tunnels. Um, could both of you just speak to that a little bit? I know you talked about no, lime. No, I, I get a soil test and I, I go ahead and add. We are not we're not organic. We're not certified organic. I don't use pesticides, but there I've noticed that there's we, we send in our plants for tissue analysis and there are specific nutrients uh, that were if I need to address something specifically, I would need to add. Um, you know, I, I I would try and use organic uh, you know at all times, but um, certain things I can't address with just adding mulch or maybe maybe you can since you're way more versed on the, the organic option on that I, I just usually follow my test results and then I send in plants for tissue analysis every week to determine I've had a lot of the uh, the uh, nutrient ripening disorder the seems to be a potassium issue and uh, I've had a lot of that but it seems to mainly be see and I had this conversation with a couple other growers it seems to mainly be in round reds I didn't see it as much in any of the other varieties but we've noticed in the last uh, last year we had a lot of the green. It was the green shoulders and the and the um, uneven ripening. So maybe you could talk about what you're adding for soil amendments. I, I think what I want to say is that I'm an old guy. All right, it just uh, I, 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 I learned I learned organic production from an organic farmer back in the late '60s, early '70s. Okay, so to some extent it was still really in its infancy. And, and I think that organic has really advanced since then. But I'm stubborn and I have my own beliefs. Uh, my philosophy is to uh, add lots of organic matter because I think that forgives a wide range of, of bills. I think, too, the more organic matter you stuff into your soil, the more uh, so soil microbial activity you'll have. And the more of that you have, the more minerals that it makes available to the plants. And I do what I call my organic shotgun approach is I actually use uh, North Atlantic kelp and I add that for micronutrients. So what I like about that is um, 
you'll find uh, cold water uh, Atlantic kelp grows over a long period of time. So it accumulates almost every known element or every element known to man. It, it, so it has this huge array, but it, in a really nice uh, ratio of element to element. And I find because of that, we do not see any type of uh, micronutrient deficiency in any of our products. We have a fabulous flavor and we also have tremendous uh, shelf life. You know, people talk to us about how long our product lasts versus other, other products that they grow mm -hmm. or buy. And, and so I think that that means a lot. We use a, a, a chicken, a pelleted chicken product called Replenish. Comes out of layer facility. We buy it out of uh, the uh, Seymour in the Anna plant out of United Granulations. They're on the web. Um, it's a 343 analysis with 10% uh, calcium. Uh, we apply it at the rate of 15 pounds per 100 square feet. Basically, in a 96 foot long high tunnel, your beds are basically 90 foot long, okay, give or take. Mm -hmm. So one bag of that splits into two five gallon buckets, spread into our wide rows, they're 42 inches wide. We do it once in the spring, once in the fall, and one bag uh, per bed. And, and with that, we also mix in a couple of cups of kelp. And, and we do that just once a year. But that seems to work really, really well for us. We've, been doing it successfully for about 20 years, and we have not seen uh, any kind of salt buildup. Uh, it, we just or nutrient deficiency, right? You know, so it does seem to be working well for us. Great. How about compost? Do either of you add compost? Yeah, we don't really have a source on the farm. We don't have any animals. We're kind of a. It's almost kind of like an urban farm. It's every. We're eight tenths of a mile away from the main main street in our town, and it, the street. Um, all the way down is, is a zoned uh, city, and our street is a dead end. Everybody's got five acre tracks, and it's zoned agricultural. So um, we don't we don't really have any animals. We don't really have a good source of of composting material in that in that nature. Um, but we do a cover crop. We'll do um, uh, we did like I said buckwheat in the in the shot there. Um, I know that the UK has, has listed a lot of uh, a good mixes and uh, and everything, but uh, but yeah, that's primarily it for us. And it's like I said, the buckwheat also attracts lots of beneficials as well. And Blair will send you from the the, the bug lady. She will send you a nice a uh, uh, beneficial mix, cover crop mix too that you can add. Oh great! We really don't use a, a very much compost at all. Most of it's just a matter of finding time to make it. Um, most products uh, that's sold on the market, I have uh, objection to something or other on it. Uh, so uh, when we do have compost, we basically use it as a soil inoculant. Use it to just introduce more soil microbes is how we use it. Okay, great. And the last question is, what do you guys do for water? Do you use rainwater? First, I think using rainwater is a great idea. I mean, especially when we look at uh, again how much water is being shed by these high tunnels. Uh, in my opinion, the next step would be to come up with some type of rainwater catchment system. If uh, you Google that. There's a great brochure out of Iowa State. It's with the Leopold Association. Uh, they have some diagrams and on it. I think you've got an experiment going at the uh, UK South Farm, maybe doing some of that, um, especially with, with rainwater catchment and then even solar uh, pumping with uh, or even gravity-fed low PSI. I think that's that would be fabulous. That's going to help close the circle. Ourselves, we actually use city water. Um, the only thing I have to say about that is we do run a filter on it, and I'm always appalled at how much particle matter we collect in the filter. I think, and I'm drinking this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we use we use city water, city water as well, and I uh, consider digging a well, but I mean the price for that just goes up every year. You know, if I would have done it in the beginning, it would have been cost efficient. But uh, but yeah, we're on city water now, and and uh, you know I've I've gone to pay pay the bill a few times, and you know are there restrictions and they're always just like, no, just be nice, you know. Don't, you know. And we, you know, we try and water early, uh, or, or you know, or turn it on, you know, at six in the morning or something to get it soaked before to optimize. And we do use the the trickle uh, the trickle irrigation. I use a six inch spacing. Uh, I, I can get it a little wetter faster, in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, the the city water. It's uh, you know, when people are complaining about how cheap the tomato prices are from other vendors, you know, and yours are more. And it's like, well, you didn't just pay, you know, a $600 water bill. Mm -hmm. And then they usually, you know, are, oh, okay, well, you yeah. know. So, but, uh, but yeah, we use city water. Okay, great. 
Well, that's all we the questions we've got for tonight. So thank you so much again for being here and for helping us out. Um, I'll leave the uh, webinar window open if you guys are still downloading um, the handout or uh, trying to get to those websites. I'll leave that open for another couple minutes. But with that, thank you so much for your attention through the whole series. And um, like I said, let us know if we can help with anything. Have a great night.